If we haven't met yet, my name is Katie Gale. I serve as the executive pastor of ministry here. Uh, And I've shared in the past that I have a deep love of the ocean and of the beach. And that love really has come from my mother. My mom, her whole life, she just loves to be on the beach. It doesn't matter which coast we're on. We won't see her for hours because she'll just be out walking up and down the beach. And uh, she's played this little game for over 60 years where wherever she goes, she tries to find a perfect sand dollar on the beach. Do you know what a sand dollar is? It's a seashell that's flat and round. I have a picture of one. Um, and so she's, she's logged hundreds of hours, thousands of miles, and she's never found one on the beach. And a couple of years ago, she was in Florida visiting my grandmother, walking the beach, of course, because that's what she does. And she walked along and she found one. And it was so exciting, she picked it up, but it had a little crack on the top. She'd only ever found fragments before. She really wanted to find the perfect one. So she decided it wasn't good enough, so she put it back on the beach. And this guy came up to her, he had been watching her do this, and he asked her about it, and my mom said, you know, I'm, I've always been looking for this perfect sand dollar, I've never found one, that one was close, but not that good. And he got this sheepish grin on his face, and he admitted that he goes to the store and he buys sand dollars, and then he puts them on the beach, and he hides and watches people find them. <laughs> and so he said to her, you know, in my car over here, I have a better one if you want that one. <laughs> And my mom was like, no, that's weird. I'm gonna just like keep walking the beach. This has now become this fun thing in my family and someday we'll find this this elusive thing out in nature. Uh, Well, this summer, my family was in Northern California for my sabbatical and my parents came out and joined us. And we spent this glorious day at at a beach called Duran Beach in Bodega Bay. And it was beautiful and it's this incredible walkable beach, which is the highest priority to my mother. And we're all walking along, my parents, Jeff and I, the kids, and as we walk along, we find one, an actual real life sand dollar in nature. It was like Christmas morning, we couldn't believe it. It was so exciting that we were, and it was so special, we were all together. And as we were walking along, we found another one. And then we found another one. And the kids are running up and down and they are spotting them. It was so exciting. And they came in all different colors and black and purple and yellow and white and all different sizes. And we started collecting them and then we lined them up on this log. I have this picture. These are just some that we found that day. And it was so fun. But you know what happened? Like an hour in, the novelty of it kind of wore off. We had found so many, we didn't need to keep looking. This thing that had just held our attention, our family, everywhere we would go, we would say, Mom, we're going to help you find a sand dollar. The extraordinary, profound, fun, exciting thing had just become ordinary. Now it was no longer a big deal to find a sand dollar on the beach. You know, we do that in other aspects of our lives as well. We allow the extraordinary, the wonderful, the exciting, the profound to just become ordinary. Once we've experienced something enough, we forget the power of it. It's like in marriage. We can be with someone for so long that we forget who that person is or why we fell in love with them in the first place. The extraordinary becomes ordinary. We stop placing so much emphasis and excitement there. And we do the same thing with our relationship with God. We hear these extraordinary truths about God. God forgives you. God loves you. God redeems you. You know, when we're first followers of Jesus in the very beginning, those are the most incredible truths. They just pierce our souls. Nothing else is louder in our lives than those truths. But over time, those extraordinary things become really ordinary. Maybe even seemingly irrelevant in our lives. They no longer pierce our souls or speak louder than the other voices around us. We're in a sermon series right now through the book of 1 John. We're nearing the end of it. We're coming close to Advent. And I don't know if you've noticed as we've gone through this letter that John kind of says the same things over and over again. God is truth. God is light. God is love. You should love. I was preparing this sermon this week and I was reading through this passage out of 1 John 4 and 5 over and over and I thought, didn't I preach the same passage like a month ago? <laughs> like, why is it so similar? It's because we as humans, we're forgetful. We become apathetic. 
We can lose the wonder of these truths. We just get tossed back and forth by the worldly philosophies and worldviews around us. And John, over and over again in this book, tells us this is truth. This is God. This is who you are. This is the kind of community that you are called to. Wellspring, let's not let these extraordinary truths, this extraordinary reality become or lose its power in our life. And I pray that we would have fresh ears to hear God's word today. So if you have your scriptures, we are in 1 John 4, beginning in verse 7. John is addressing his beloved community, and he greets them and says, Dear friends, let us love one another as God has loved us. Now let's stop there. Let us love one another as God has loved us. This is like my family's sand dollar quest. This is an extraordinary thing, so amazing and exciting. Because we've heard it so much, it's lost its, its sparkle, it's lost its power. It's similar to our gospel reading today out of John 3.16. How many times have we heard that? But sometimes it goes in one ear out the other. It's no longer this transforming truth in our lives. But it's profound. Let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Because God is love. Here is the simple and ex yet extraordinary big idea that John wants you to know from this passage. God is love. Now we spend a lot of time talking about love in our culture. It's the source, you know, the subject of countless songs. It's the climax of a romantic movie. It's uh, the source of conflict and humor in a sitcom. You know, the, Friends, the show Friends milked the Ross and Rachel love story for 10 years. And love is not just the source for fiction, but it's the source of our conviction when it comes to fighting injustice. It's the justification for legislation. It, it's the banner over any important movement in humanity. Love seems to be the end-all, be-all in our culture. To quote the Beatles, all we need is love. Now, when we, when we think about that, we have to ask, what do we mean by love? How do we understand it? How do we define it? How do we recognize it? Is it just absolute acceptance of another person? Is that love? Is it the you know, safe, warm, gooey feelings of falling in love for the first time? But then when those feelings have gone away, does that mean love has gone away? Is it the thing that we pursue and we promote above all else? You know, all we need is love. Well, John tells us in this passage that God is love. But you know what, what can happen is sometimes we flip that when we read it and our culture flips it to read, love is God. And if love is God, then as Dr. Marion May Thompson points out, then it will be the thing that we live for, that we serve, it will be the ultimate standard of all of life. Love then becomes the thing that we seek. We become in love with love, with loving, with seeking love, with receiving love. Love becomes this abstract connection to something bigger than ourselves. Love becomes God. And then love is then what we seek. Love is our final and supreme good. Now that sounds like truth, right? That sounds good. We've been saying in this sermon series that the Apostle John, one of the main things he's doing in this book is he's combating false philosophies of his day. He's cutting through the worldviews that people are putting their hope in. People think, this is what gives me my salvation. This is what I need to believe. And he's cutting through that with the truth of the gospel. What really brings salvation? What really brings freedom? What really brings hope? And God is, saying, is doing the same thing to us today through this word. He's cutting through our false philosophies of the day, of our day, and he's speaking the gospel. And what's, what's really sneaky about false worldviews is that they always incorporate an aspect of truth. Always. They intertwine the worldly philosophies with Christian truth. And what happens when we enmesh the world with the gospel is we get a muddied reality. It's like if we had a vase with clear water, and we just put a, a handful of dirt in, and another handful, and another handful. It's still water, but it's actually now closer to mud than water. 
It's no longer the, the, the clear water that it once was, the pure thing. And when we, add true, when we add things to the truth of the gospel, we distort it. It's close to the real thing, but it's not the pure thing. And, and that is what we see in this nuanced understanding of love. Now, obviously, the Bible talks a lot about love. Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, the most quoted passage at weddings, we had it at our wedding, and he says, these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. John, in just a few verses down in this chapter, he tells us, perfect love drives out fear. What a beautiful promise. Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, as I have loved you, I command you now to love one another. So certainly, love is central to the gospel. And yet, the philosophy of our culture, what we hear, that's sneaky, is that love itself is the thing, is the thing we should seek. That love itself is what sets us free or gives us our identity. All we need is love. Love then becomes our God. And then what's accepted as truth, what we hear as truth is that you just need to love people. As long as you're kind and you're accepting, you do more good than bad, then you're good enough. That's enough. Just love. But that's an incomplete understanding of our reality. We must turn to the source of love, the embodiment of love, the definition of love. God is love. And because God is love, then love comes from God. As John tells us in verse 7, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. And then he says something interesting. He says, everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Now, a very fair question to ask is, does that mean that only Christians who know God can love one another? Well, certainly not. We see many loving non-Christians in our world, some who embody, display love far better than Christians do. I come from a non-Christian family, and my parents have poured out genuine love to me and my sister and our, my kids and our families. My mom has spent her whole career loving and serving those on the margins, those experiencing poverty. So certainly, non-Christians display love in our world. And why is that? How is that? It's because all people are created in the image of God who is love. So we all have the capacity to love. Actually, the existence of love in our world is a signpost to God, or to use N.T. Wright's language, it's an echo of the God who is love. Our love, love in this world, actually points to the God who is love. So what John is saying here is that he's looking at us, and he's saying, as Christians, those who know the source of love, surely we will be transformed by the love of God. Surely we will love one another. Surely God's love will so flow out of us to love others. John says something similar in verses 15 and 16. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Again, here he repeats his big idea. God is love, and so we will know and rely on the love God has for us. This verse is just played over and over in my head this week, that we will know and rely on the love God has for us. The assurance and the confidence that we can stand on that, that we know who we are, whose we are, that we are loved. We can know and rely on the love God has for us. Now, anyone who's driven kids around in a car, you know that oftentimes you can have the best conversations because they're strapped in the back with nowhere to go. Uh, and last week I was driving my two kids around and my almost two-year-old Lily started singing, which was just like making screeching noises because that's what that sounds like. And for some reason, it prompted Micah, my, my four-year-old, to say that I love Lily the most because she was singing to me. I don't know why. Kids think weird things. But I tried to explain to him, like, no, Micah, I have enough love for both of you. It's like, God, he has enough love for everyone. I was trying to do my best to explain that. And Micah, unprompted, just shouted out, I definitely know that God loves me. The confidence on this kid is astounding. 
But I was also struck with the reality that he doesn't have the fear or insecurity that I do. Man, so often I think, Lord, am I doing enough to earn your love? Am I doing enough to please you? Am I doing enough to receive your love? And I want to be like a child who can just say, I definitely know that God loves me. To know and rely on the love God has for me because God is love. So then what does God say about love? What does love look like? If he is the source of love, he's the definition of love, then we should look to him to define it and not to the sources of our world. And John actually tells us really clearly in this passage in verses 9 and 10. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. What a clear description of the gospel. Now, so often we, we say, we stand on the gospel, we know the truth of the gospel, but if you ever wonder, what do we mean by that? How do I know and understand the gospel? Read these verses over and over again. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his son, the most precious gift he could give. And through Jesus, we find life. We live through him. And God did not send his son because we deserved it, because we've earned it. We didn't love God. He first loved us. See, God pursued. He came toward us. He forgave us. He gave atonement for our sins. It was our actions that brought death and evil and separation and brokenness. And it's God's actions that bring life and redemption. Paul will say it like this in Romans 5, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I want to draw out three implications of God's display of love from this passage. The first is that God's love brings life. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. The second is that God, God's love pursues. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son. And finally, that God's love restores. He sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. God's love brings life. God's love pursues. God's love restores. Let's dig into those a little bit. God's love brings life. Here's this really um, well-known piece of art from the Sistine Chapel of Michelangelo. And we see God reaching out to Adam, who's just, his hand is lifeless. And in his touch, in God's touch, it brings life. And God's touch in our life brings life. Where we need healing, where we are broken, God's love brings healing. Where we are walking down paths of destruction, he leads us into paths of flourishing. God's love opens up eternal life for us. A childhood mentor of my husband Jeff's recently passed away from dementia. And even as his family grieves, they were able to say this beautiful statement. They, they said, we have confidence that we can celebrate his fully healed new life in heaven. God's love brings life both now and for eternity. And God's love pursues us. Even in our sin, when we have turned away, when we are unfaithful, when we forget our first love, God's love always pursues. Like the father in the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15, if you know that story, the son takes his inheritance, he swindles it, he, then he, you know, he runs away, he stays away out of fear of shame and condemnation that he won't be accepted. And the father runs after his beloved child. And that's you. God's love pursues you. And God's love restores. God sent his son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. While we were still sinners, while we were enemies of God, separated in our unrighteousness, God sought us out and made a way for our redemption and restoration and relationship with him. God's love has the power to redeem any person. 
John says in verse 15, if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. They have been fully restored in God. Do you believe that? That God's love restores you? Have you turned to Jesus? Do you need to turn to him yet again? Do we need to turn to him yet again? Because God's love brings life, God's love pursues, and God's love restores. Now John begins our passage today, he's talking to his, this community that he cares about, he loves, and he greets them, dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. And then he explains what love looks like, what God's love looks like, and then he greets them again with the same very endearing greeting in verse 11. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And when we do that, God is revealed in some mysterious way. No one has ever seen God, but he is known, his love is made complete in us as we love one another. That's a profound mystery. And John here tells us we ought to love one another. This is a command. He doesn't say, just rest in God's love for you. He doesn't say, since God so loved you, you only have to love the easy people in your life. He doesn't say, since God so loved you, you can take a pass on people that have hurt you, who seem unlovable, people that you don't like. No, the command is, since God so loved us, let us love one another. We ought to love one another. Now, sometimes that's easy. I was at our Wednesday noon prayer gathering this week, and I was sitting towards the back, and I was just, I was watching people walk up to each other and greet one another with ease. And I just, it's like, Lord, what a sweet community that people are glad to see each other and want to love each other. And that's wonderful. But we all know that that's not always that easy. It doesn't always come as natural to love one another. But we, as the ones that know God, the source of love, we ought to, we are commanded to love one another. And our love should look like God's love. Our love should bring life, our love should pursue, and our love should restore. So as God's love brings life, we also ought to be people that bring life and healing. And what can that look like? Well, we know that loving someone is not only being with them in the easy times, but in the really hard times. Maybe that means when they're making destructive choices, we speak the truth in love, hoping to lead towards life. Or it could mean being with them in the consequences of their decisions. If someone in your life is literally going through the valley of death and darkness through an illness or a diagnosis, life-giving love means being present, praying for them, holding hope for them, maybe just doing practical things for them. Loving someone in your life that's deconstructing their faith or has walked away from the Lord means praying for them actually longing for them to walk in the life of Christ, believing that God will never leave them or forsake them. See, God's love brings life, and so we are to be people who love in a way that brings life. Are there people in your life who are stuck, who are believing lies, who seem to be in the pit of death? What does it look like for us to be a people who walk alongside and help move us, point us to life? And as God's love pursues, we also ought to be people who pursue, who move toward one another and not just close off or push people away out of our frustration or angerness or bitterness or hurt. Because Jesus pursued. While we were still sinners, enemies of God, he came toward us. And if that's true of Jesus, it should be true of us. John tells us in verses 19 and 20, we love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. That's a strong word. We need to be people who pursue, who seek after, who initiate love. God pursued us in love even when we couldn't pursue him. I can't think of a more beautiful example of pursuit than adoption of bringing a child into a family, of welcoming them home. 
November is Adoption Awareness Month, and Wellspring has many families who are engaged in adoption. And it's just this beautiful expression of moving towards a child when they can't themselves, a child that needs to be seen and welcomed. As our Heavenly Father has done this for us, so we are called to reach out, to love, to pursue, to welcome. I just want to encourage our community to pray, ask the Lord, what does it look like for us to engage and support families of adoption here at Wellspring? It's the role of all parents to pursue, to press in, to go after the child, even in their disobedience, even in their their suffering, their pushing away, we always move towards. And that's not just true of parents, but that's true of all followers of Jesus, followers of the God who is love. We live out a love that pursues. So is there anyone in your life that you need to pursue, that you need to seek reconciliation with? Maybe you know someone who's pushed people away, who's isolated themselves from community, and they just need someone to reach out and say, I see you, I love you. Is there anyone in this church family that you're avoiding because you, would, you disagree with them? We just come, came off of an election week, surely. This is the time when we push people away when we disagree, right? No, we are people that pursue, that come towards each other, that seek to love one another. What does it look like for us to be a people of love who have been transformed by the love of God and who pursue one another? And as God's love restores, then we ought to be people who bring restoration. One of the privileges of being a pastor is is getting to hear those testimonies when God does a work of restoration, when a marriage that just seems so far gone actually is reconciled and healed, or when a child is estranged from a family and somehow they all find their way back to each other in a depth of healing that no one thought possible, or someone that's gone through immense loss or a divorce, God does a healing work and surrounds them with the love of community and they're restored, or friends who've hurt one another, have turned their backs on one another, have been fully restored in relationship, and I've seen that in my own life. In all of those stories, we just see the same thing, a choosing to move toward one another in repentance, seeking to love one another as God has loved us, and longing for restoration in ways that only God can restore. God's love restores, and we are to be a people that bring restoration. In the beginning of chapter five here, John says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and then carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. Our world divides, separates, pits one, it puts people against one another. Without Christ, we're swept up in bitterness and unforgiveness. But in Christ, as we believe in Jesus as the Son of God, the one who forgives, the one who reconciles, the one who restores, then we also carry that mantle out into the world as those who forgive, who reconcile, who restore. Is there anyone in your life that you need restoration with? Pray. Let's believe in the power of prayer that the Holy Spirit can do a work to restore in ways we can't even imagine. God commands us to love one another and John tells us his commands are not burdensome. He has gone before us. He is the source of love. He will do a work of beauty far beyond what you can imagine. Wellspring, I I pray we hear afresh today that you are so loved I pray that we can know and rely on the love God has for us. I hope that we can shout at the top of our lungs like a little child, I definitely know that God loves me. But that we can take it a step further and say, I definitely know that God loves you. And even another step further to say, I definitely know that I love you. Because our world needs to hear that. Our families, our kids, Our friends, our guests, our homeless guests in the well, they need to hear, you are loved. And as God has so loved us, then we ought to love one another. And it's through our love that God will be revealed in the world. Jesus tells us in John 13, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another.